Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Warren Geller, President and CEO of Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, and we're honored to be hosting Governor Christie today on this very important health care initiative. I'd also like to welcome Robert Logie, Acting Attorney General, Steve Lee, Acting Director, Consumer Affairs, Gurbir Grawal, Acting Prosecutor, welcome, Mrs. Linda Teefee, who is the mayor's wife from Monroe Township, where Amanda lives, and thank you for coming out here. Senator Loretta Weinberg, Assemblywoman Valerie Huddle, welcome everyone, how are you? And our mayor, Mayor Frank Huddle, thank you for coming. Englewood Hospital and Medical Center is pleased to always be ranked at the very top in patient safety and healthcare quality. And just yesterday, we received our ninth our ninth A grade in a row from the LeapFrog Group for Patient Safety. Thank you. Only five other hospitals in the state of New Jersey have received straight A's throughout all of the ratings periods. And one of those are our partners in Hackensack University Medical Center, so we're proud to be called their partner. I want to thank all of our outstanding clinicians for always doing the right thing. Good medicine is good business, and it proves out over time. We have learned that here at the medical center, it's about creating a culture. We call it a culture of excellence, which includes the safety and the quality for all of our patients. And today we have a very special guest. Amanda Patopchuk, who's going to come up here and share with us a very personal story. Amanda, please. Thank you. Uh, it is an honor to stand here today to discuss the subject that, is with, that has been with me and my loved ones for 13 years. I am here to humanize the disease of addiction. Governor Christie, thank you for being one of the first public figures who acknowledge that addiction is not a choice. But addiction is a, a disease and should be treated as a disease. My name is Amanda Potopchuk. I am 28 years old. I was born and raised in Williamstown, New Williamstown, Monroe Township, Gloucester County in southern New Jersey. It's the suburbs of Philadelphia and Camden. I have been in sustained remission from a severe opioid use disorder since September 2007. What that means is I have gone 12 months or longer meeting the criteria for opioid use disorder. The prescription monitoring program was not in place during my active addiction. I am incredibly fortunate to be alive and standing before you today. I often think if the prescription monitoring program were in place, how different my life would be. Could it have been one method of prevention that could have eliminated all the suffering and detrimental effects that addiction had on myself and my loved ones? At the age of 15, I was plagued with excruciating recurrent kidney stones. The pain was frightening and unbearable. In an attempt to help control my pain, my physicians prescribed me opioids like Percocet. Between 2002 and 2006, I was legally prescribed opiates on a consistent basis. Being the young lady that I was, I did not know much about these medications other than that they made my pain go away. Within six months of being prescribed the opiates, I met the diagnostic statistical manuals criteria for an opioid use disorder. I was no longer taking the, pain pills for, the, taking the pills for pain. I was taking them to survive. I was 16 years old. What I assumed were flu-like symptoms were withdrawal symptoms, and they subsided each time I took an opiate. Taking an opiate each day became as routine for me as brushing my teeth or combing my hair before school. None of my friends or family used drugs. I exhibited no signs of being under the influence of um, drugs. Teenagers sleep. Teenagers are moody. I have seen teachers in recent months who have said, Amanda, we had no idea that you were using drugs or you were under the influence in school. We're sorry we didn't help you. People have said to me, well, you couldn't have been that addicted. You don't look like a drug addict. I went to the prom under the influence. I went to my high school graduation under the influence. By, 19th, my, by 19 years old, my health insurance had expired. Through word of mouth, I found a doctor in the Camden County area of New Jersey who would prescribe the pills without insurance. Each month I would stand in a long line outside his practice waiting to get my prescription. I would then walk right next door to an affiliated pharmacy and get my prescription filled. 
The cost of going to this doctor became too expensive for me after a few months. My family and friends realized the extent of my addiction at this point. I left home and was out on my own, and by my 20th birthday, I had been using heroin. I remember feeling terrified to try heroin, but I was desperate. I was sick. The first time I used heroin, I recall thinking, this is nothing compared to the high of my pills. For me, I wondered why people had feared heroin when many took pills that were so similar, even stronger than heroin. In, October, in August 2007, I used heroin with an individual. That individual lost their life and I lived. My story is sadly not an uncommon story. It is one that has been happening for years now, all over the country, and in particular, my home in South Jersey, which has been rocked by this epidemic. I believe that the problem is complex. Blame cannot and should not be blamed, placed solely on the patient, the prescribers, or the pharmacist. My physicians had a duty to treat my pain, but they also had a duty to alert me and my parents about the possibility of misuse and the risk for dependence or addiction while on these medications. They should have been monitoring me for any signs of addiction, and when these signs became apparent, they should have referred me to addictions counseling or found other methods to control my pain. Sadly, none of those things happened. The PMP is one of what I can only hope becomes many programs in this wonderful state we live in to prevent any more loss and suffering. I thank my lucky stars every day that I'm here standing before you. I'm a person. I'm someone's daughter. I'm someone's sister. I'm someone's aunt. And I'm someone's niece. I'm someone's girlfriend. I'm someone's friend. I was a kid. I was 15. I was 16. I was 17. I was 18. And I was 19 years old. For the last seven years, I've worked as a direct care provider for individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities who reside in, in southern New Jersey. In 2012, I graduated with an associate's degree from Rowan College. In 2014, I graduated with a BS in psychology from Wilmington University where I graduated with honors. This summer, I will graduate from Wilmington University with a master's of science in the administration of human services. I'd like to thank everyone in this state, in my hometown, in my county, who devote their lives to combat and summit that epidemic. Thank you. What a brave young lady. And Amanda, thank you, because it's stories like yours that ultimately save lives. It really is an honor and a privilege today to host Governor Christie, and thank you, Governor, for bringing the prescription monitoring program through for not just our state, for New York State, and convincing Governor Cuomo to come along for the ride. It's extremely important to all of us because hospitals and doctors alike get to do the right thing for our patients, and for our community. So without further ado, Governor Chris Christie. Thank you, Governor Chris. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank Amanda. Um, I spend a lot of my time as governor talking about this issue. And when people ask me why I do, um, it's because of folks like Amanda and her mom. Um, I'm a dad, too. And one of the worst nightmares any parent can have is the idea that their child might be subjected to the story that Amanda just told and that her mother and her loved ones have had to endure over a period of time. While listening to Amanda's story, it's, it has a happy ending. Um, it didn't have to. And she mentioned some in her speech um, who didn't have a happy ending. Uh, that's why I continue to talk about this issue and work so hard. That's why I continue to be an advocate um, to other states for getting involved in every way they can to try to allow our health care providers in our state to be a part of the solution uh, to problems like this. And so I'm thrilled that Amanda would come today. And I thank her for her courage and her composure. Um, she walked in here and saw those cameras and she said, wow. And I said, yeah. Don't worry about it. They don't bite, at least not you. Um, <laughs> so um, I want to thank her for being here. I also want to acknowledge, obviously, the presence of um, Senator Cardinale and Assemblyman Auth, who are here as well. Appreciate their presence and their support for this program and for other initiatives that we've had in the area of drug abuse. And I'm particularly proud to be here today with Prosecutor Gruwal. Um, he is the type of prosecutor that I've tried to appoint across the state, someone who has experience as a prosecutor, who knows how important it is to prevent crime and to keep streets safe, but also understands that in this really complex age where drug addiction is a disease, that prosecutors must be part of the solution 
not just throwing people in jail, but looking for solutions to the addiction. And all across the state, um, one of the things I'm proudest of is the quality of the men and women that we've put in these prosecutors' positions. And it took a while to get you here, but I'm glad you are here. And I think the people of Bergen County are going to be extraordinarily happy um, with the results that you helped to provide to them in leading that office and leading a fight here in this county as we're trying to do in all the other 20 um, to modernize the way we think about these issues and these problems in a way that will help to spare families like Amanda's from the suffering and the pain that they've gone through already um, and serve, have the state serve as an as a absolute model um, for the rest of the country on how to deal with the addiction issue. According to the CDC, more people died from drug overdoses in 2014 than in any other year on record. Since 1999, overdose, overdose deaths from opioids, including prescription opioids and heroin, have nearly quadrupled since 1999. Many pathways to addiction and dealing with its causes, but we know prescription drug abuse is a common one that we have to wrap our arms around as government leaders and as medical professionals. One of the ways that we're taking action together is through New Jersey's prescription monitoring program, one of our best tools in the fight against the diversion of prescription drugs. Uh, it's an innovative data sharing partnership between the New Jersey Attorney General's Office and our state's prescribers and pharmacists, and it's a vital resource that keeps detailed information on every prescription filled in New Jersey for medications classified as CDS, Controlled Dangerous Substances, including potentially addictive opiate painkillers. Since September 2011, the database has captured information on more than 59 million written prescriptions. Through the work of our Division of Consumer Affairs under the direction of Steve Lee, there's been an unprecedented expansion that New Jersey has led in providing access to the entire community of our physicians and other licensed health care practitioners. As of last week, more than 96% of New Jersey's physicians are registered, a total of 28,550. I want to give you some perspective on this. I went back to the Medical Society in 2012. The participation rate at that time was in the teens. And I said to them, I asked for the, for the meeting, um, and I said to them, you, know, you, you, you all come to me all the time on a regular basis and tell me you don't want government regulating you anymore, you don't want us setting the rules that impose upon your ability to be able to do your jobs the way you're taught to do your jobs. Um, I said, I'm happy to hold off as much of that regulation as I possibly can, but you have to give me a reason to hold it off. And participation in the teens is unacceptable. So I put a challenge in front of the Medical Society that day. I said, I'll give you one year to markedly increase those numbers. If you do, I'll continue to put a stop to any attempt to make it mandatory. And there were bills pending in the legislature at that time to do it. I said, but in return, you have to provide the leadership that tells physicians and other health care providers that you need to participate in this voluntarily. Uh, we went in one year from the teens up well over 60% a participation through the effort, I think, predominantly of the Medical Society and their members, and now proud to say that we're over 96% of our physicians enrolled voluntarily in this program without the heavy hand of government requiring it and God knows setting all kinds of other rules that they would have set that they knew absolutely nothing about in the process. The total number of health care users, including physicians, other CDS prescribers, and pharmacists is now over 49,000 which represents more than 70% of all the total eligible prescribers and pharmacists in the state. Really good, but we've got about 23% to go. So we're gonna to continue to push on that. And since its inception, more than 6 million user requests have been conducted just on our PMP alone. Really important. So that's why I'm more pleased to announce our collaboration with the state of New York. Partnering with New York adds tremendous strength to the PMP's ability to track suspicious signs of prescription drug misuse and other suspicious behaviors. And I want to personally thank Governor Andrew Cuomo for his commitment to this multi-state effort. Um, Governor Cuomo and I meet on a regular basis um, and we talk all the time about the issues that are by state in nature. Um, this is one that I brought to him and asked for him to consider New York being a part of and as a part of our partnership over the course of the last six years since he came to office um, we have done this together as another addition to the things that we've done together. I don't think that any governors of New York and New Jersey have had a better relationship in my lifetime than the relationship I have with Governor Cuomo. 
Um, and this is just another result of that relationship where we listen to each other, um, we take advice from each other, um, and we act on things that make sense. And uh, I thank Governor Cuomo a great deal for stepping forward today and the state of New York stepping forward. Our latest data shows that prescribers in New Jersey are successfully making use of the ability to view cross-border prescription information. For instance, during the first nine months of 2015, the Interstate Hub enabled 29,525 prescriber data requests in the first quarter, 38,900 additional ones in the second quarter, 46,000 additional ones in the third quarter, just between New Jersey, Connecticut, and Delaware. Really important. For the fourth quarter, when South Carolina, Minnesota, Rhode Island, and Virginia joined us at our request, the prescriber data for all six states just in the fourth quarter increased to over 63,600 requests. In just the eight days of operation that we've had with New York, the interstate hub in eight days has had 16,000 data requests in eight days. This is the kind of thing that is going to save lives and make the job of our health care providers easier. Um, first, do no harm. And this is part of the way that we can help to make sure that first our health care providers do no harm. We're going to continue to remain steadfast in helping to make this law enforcement tool an equally effective health care tool. And in talking to the physicians that I spoke to this morning, um, I'm really encouraged about their enthusiasm for this. Um, they said to me they don't see it as a requirement, they see it as a tool, a tool for them to use to help their patients and their families to get the best possible care they can and to help their colleagues to understand about how all of this interacts with each other. As there always is in any great thing that happens in New Jersey, um, there is a, a, a Livingston High School graduate involved. Um, Jill Silverman is a physician here um, and uh, is a high school classmate of mine. Um, we are everywhere, Jill. I will tell you, as I traveled around the country, um, it, it became a joke amongst my campaign staff about seemingly everywhere I went, someone came up to me at an event and said they graduated from Livingston High School in X year. And I would turn to my, uh, to my assistant, Dan, and say to him, there's another one. He said, yes, Governor, I know. Another Lancer, I know. Um, and, and that's why I'm thrilled this morning to have Jill here. I said to everybody, um, it's really, really smart people like Jill that populated my high school class, which took all the spots in medical school, which is why I had to go to law school. Um, <laughs> Uh, a life saved from drug abuse and addiction can be a life restored and a family spared from anguish. I've said many times in this state that every life is an individual gift from God. Every life is an individual gift from God. And we all have an absolute moral obligation to treat every one of those lives like a gift from God, no matter what condition we find that gift in. Nine years ago, Amanda was a gift that was damaged, not out of any fault of her own, but because she followed the rules as they were laid out to her. And I think all of us, all of us who are parents, understand how extraordinarily, extraordinarily scary it is to think that your child could be confronted with this type of challenge at such a young age. One of the things Amanda said to me when we were speaking privately before was, that she's so happy she gets a chance to speak about this so maybe she can help other people. To not be scared to admit they have a problem. To not be scared to ask for help. And to have their families not feel ashamed and stigmatized that somehow their child's disease, their child's illness is a fault of theirs. We have to stop making moral judgments about this and we need to start fixing the problem. And Amanda is a perfect example of what can happen when you fix the problem, when you give her the tools, she's fixed it, not us. She's fixed it. All we did was give her the tools to be able to deal with her challenge. But every day she has to use those tools. She wakes up every morning knowing she's got to use those tools in order to make sure that she doesn't go back to the life that she had nine years ago. This is not some handout. This is not some squishy way of dealing with a problem. This is acknowledging the fact that we are all, yes, individual gifts from God, but flawed ones. And we need to help each other to overcome the flaws that we've 
got in ourselves and in our society. So, um, Amanda, I can't thank you enough for coming. For all the physicians who are here, thank you so much for your enthusiastic participation in this program. I'm going to continue to work the rest of the country to try to get them to join us in this. We had a good discussion in there about Florida. So my buddy Rick Scott, who I campaigned for 12 times for re-election, going to be getting more frequent phone calls from his friend and sponsor, the governor of New Jersey, to try to make sure that Florida, which is really, as we know, just a suburb of New Jersey, um, <laughs> and subject to our jurisdiction, I contend, um, uh, should, should, join the, um, should join the effort here, and we're going to try to get other states to do it as well. So uh, I have time to take a few questions from the press. Um, you all, if you don't want to be up here, I don't blame you, neither do I. Um, but anybody can sit or you can stand where you are, wherever you are, I'll just take a few questions for David. Governor, could you give us an example of how expanding this program with New York is going to help to prevent problems, abuse, et cetera? Sure, David. I mean, listen, first off, it, it, it's going to help prevent patients from shopping across the border, and especially in a place like Englewood. And I see Mayor Huddle here. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, in a place like Englewood, um, New York is just a hop, skip, and a jump. And for people who are determined... Yeah, well, it's very true. I've often said that New York is a quaint little suburb of New Jersey. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, for folks in Englewood, it's an easy, an easy trip uh, through public transportation or otherwise to get over to New York and, and to go and access the physician community there um, to try to get uh, prescriptions that they may not be able to get here. Uh, so New York is a big part of getting our problem in New Jersey under control. Um, and I'm sure that if Governor Cuomo were here, he would say the same thing about us, um, that there's a lot of easy access through Bergen County um, and other counties across uh, the northern part of our state to New York State, where people could come and do exactly the same thing. So when you're putting this together, having your border states um, as part of the program is really integral to the first and easiest part of getting this under control. Um, and then expanding it to the rest of the country is just about making sure that everybody uh, in a very mobile uh, society we have now um, is, being, is being monitored in the appropriate way, and not just the, 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 the patients, but the physicians. Because while the ones standing with me today are, are, are ones who are following the law and the rules and doing the best they can for their patients, we also know that, like every profession, there are some who don't and do so for a variety of reasons, including profit. Those folks need to be watched, too as do our pharmacists and our other health care providers in, this, in the system. So that's how it does it, David, and I think it's, um, it's really um, commendable that we now have 96% of our physicians in this state registered for the program. It's something I'm very proud of and proud to say that we did it voluntarily. It's the goodwill and the understanding and the smarts of the people in our medical community working with our law enforcement community who have made this happen. That's a really good thing. Governor, Michael? Two questions on two different topics. Uh, a lot of thinking today, Michael. <laughs> No, I just think it's stupid. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, I don't think there's anything dirty or underhanded. They're, they're doing it in public. So I think that probably takes out underhanded. Um, and I would substitute dirty for stupid. I mean, who, th this is why people hate politicians. You, so, so let me understand the way this is supposed to work. There's a person sitting in Indianapolis today who, said, who loves, loves John Kasich, thinks John Kasich is the best man to be president of the United States. And he or she opens up their newspaper and reads that John Kasich says, don't vote for me in Indiana. Vote for Ted Cruz. That'll be better. Do you think for a second that person's voting for Ted Cruz? Well, all John Kasich did there was lose a vote. And that person may either stay home or in a fit of peak may just go ahead and vote for Trump. So it's just, I don't think there's anything underhanded or dirty about it. I just think that Ted and John have taken leave of their senses. And that's what's happened with most of this Stop Trump stuff. These are normal people. I know them. I know Ted. I know John. I was on the same stage with them. I've worked with John for years, campaigned for him in 2010 and 2014, you know, gave him a significant amount of money in both those years. I have great respect for John Kasich. But these guys have taken leave of their senses. And it's part of this whole Stop Trump movement, which is just not tethered to reality. 
And I think that's what it's really all about, Michael. So, no, I'd say that Ted Cruz and John Kasich are neither dirty nor underhanded. In this instance, just stupid. I'll veto it. I'll veto it. Veto it. Why? Because I think it's not a good idea. Why? Because the only reason those schools districts are state-run school districts is because they've been abject failures for the people who live there. That's the only reason. The state doesn't take them over because, like, we got nothing better to do. And the, the 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 real problem here is that a few things. One, we have local school districts in many urban areas who care more about their union patrons than they care about the families who live in those communities. And the proof of that is I saw some statement put out by Mayor Baraka today where he's complaining about the effect that charter schools have on the Newark public school budget. What I'd remind the mayor is that the reason charter school enrollment is going up is because families are choosing public charter schools. The second thing I'd remind the mayor is that charter schools are public schools. They are public schools. And so what the mayor wants to do is freeze any new expansion of charter schools, freeze any new development of charter schools, so those families are forced back into the failed schools that drove them to want to make the choice to begin with. This is so illogical that if it operated anywhere else but in New Jersey, under the auspices of the New Jersey Education Association, we would think this is ridiculous. But here we somehow say, well, you know, it's just the way it is. Parents in these school districts are saying, no, we're not going to have that any longer. The second thing is the mayor complains that they had a $72 million budget hole that he says is created by these charter schools, that they asked me for $36 million and that I only gave them an additional $27 million. Now, this, of course, comes from a school district that gets hundreds of millions of dollars from New Jersey state taxpayers every year because of a failed and, I believe, unconstitutional court requirement that we put disproportionate funds into a small number of school districts and the mayor in in the greatest ironic part of his statement, says that this is causing his property taxes to go up. Well, have him come see Huddle. Ask about his property taxes in Englewood. And what happens, because I can't give him the school aid I want to give him, because the legislature and the Supreme Court says that somehow the only way to improve education in Newark and Patterson and Trenton and Camden, oh, and by the way, Hoboken, and Union City and Jersey City is to give them more money. And every time I give them more money from state income tax revenue, it's less money that goes to huddle. It's got to end. It's got to end. And so I find the whole thing laughable. And I think that Assemblyman Wimberley, instead of wasting time on press conferences in Trenton, should perhaps focus on having more effective schools in Patterson. And Mayor Baraka, who, of course, drew his paycheck from the public school system before he stopped taking the paycheck from there and took his paycheck from the city hall taxpayers, he doesn't want any of this to change. He complains in the press release about the teachers that we're not letting into classrooms anymore, but we're continuing to pay. He says that's a waste of money. I agree. Let me fire them. Because if they're too ineffective to be in a classroom, why the hell are we paying them? You know why we're paying them? Because the teachers' union owns this state. That's why. Because we can't fire the least able, for goodness sakes. Then they wouldn't pay dues anymore. And then, you know, the head of the NJEA wouldn't make 400 grand a year, plus their teacher pension. So, you know, Michael, I have no sympathy at all for urban leaders who continue to sell their constituents down the river because the NJEA writes them checks and that they're scared to death of these people. 
I've never been scared of these people from the minute I announce for public office, and from the time till I leave public office, I won't be scared of them, and I'll call them out. And you know who else is calling them out? Urban parents. Why are there thousands of people still on the waiting list in Newark for charter schools? Because they think the public schools are doing such a great job? No, because they want something better for their children. You know what? They deserve something better for their children. My children shouldn't be the only ones who get a great education because we live in a place where they can get one. It's wrong. It continues to be wrong. But every time I go to the legislature about this, I hear the same old song. Oh, we can't do that. Why? Well, you know, we can't do that. We all know why they can't do that. Bought and paid for. Bought and paid for. And there's no other reason not to do it. Everybody knows this stuff is true. And the last piece of this is public charter schools were set up as laboratories so that you can learn what was working there and you can apply it to the public schools. But here's, here's the deal. You can't apply it to the public schools. You know why? Because they won't change the work rules. They won't give principals more flexibility. They won't have longer school days. They won't have a longer school year. They won't require the things that charter schools require of their families and their children. It's an outrage. And I am sickened by the fact that they're down there playing the theater they're playing down in Trenton. But I should, I, believe me, I'm not the least bit surprised. Not the least bit surprised. It's the same stupid show day after day after day. And whether you're talking about this thing or Atlantic City, or the Transportation Trust Fund, or any other stuff, it's the same stupid show every day. And people are tired of it, and so am I. So we're gonna spend some time talking about that, Michael. Everybody wanted me back. Can't. <laughs> Everybody wanted me back, man. I am back. I am back, and they're gonna have every minute of every day of me. Every minute of every day, Michael. They'll be. Especially for you, Weinberg. Um, <laughs> next question. Yeah, Dustin. Justice Timpone. I'd like you to refer to him as Justice Timpone since he is Justice Timpone. Justice Timpone, Timpone before he was uh, confirmed as justice, um, heard people always to investigate the uh, campaign finance uh, fees for the regarding Joe DiVincenzo. Then he refused to vote in on the complaint in 2013. Then he withdrew his refusal in 2015, and then later refused again. Um, this was only brought up at the Judiciary Committee hearing last week uh, once regarding the 2013 recusal. So uh, the other two were not brought up. So two questions. Um, do you think that he misled the Judiciary Committee by not being forthcoming about these other two recusals and non-recusals? And is it possible that he broke the law because the recusal must be absolute? No and no. Next question. Yeah. Hey, Governor, question about the, uh, the announced uh, program expansion today. Um, it's been reserved, I think it's October 2014, that negotiations began on the program. Is there anything about the, the agreement with New York that is more comprehensive or different from the agreements with other states like Delaware and Connecticut, such that it took a longer time to achieve? No. Just think it took a longer time to achieve. There's nothing different about it. We have the same kind of agreements with them that we have with the other states. <laughs> You know, sometimes, you know, this happens with us as well. Um, when other states are asking you to do certain things, some things you focus on, some things you don't. And, um, you know, Governor Cuomo was focused on this most recently and, and got a movement to get a decision made. But there's nothing different about the agreements. No, um, but as you can tell from the volume, the volume is going to be significantly greater than anything else we've done before. Eight days, 16,000 requests already. So it's, it's going to be an enormous volume. I can't estimate to you how much it's going to be over a year, but... If we get eight days and 16,000 hits, it's a lot. Can you give us a sense of the scale compared to other states like uh, Delaware? Well, I mean, I just gave, I gave you some of the numbers in my remarks. I mean, if you think about the fact that, where is it here, that we've, that our hits of 16,000, I'm trying to find, this is what happens when I get these written things. can't always find them. Okay, so, for instance, if you think that in 15, with New York out, we had 29,525 requests in the first quarter. Now with New York in, we had 16,000 hits just from New York in eight days. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, to us, 
it's the single most important expansion we've had so far because of the size of the physician and healthcare community in New York, the amount of time that people in New Jersey spend at times accessing healthcare in New York, and the fact that they're our largest neighbor. All those things are gonna make it just much bigger. And I think a much more effective than expansion of the program um, in terms of being able to prevent the things we're looking to prevent. Yeah? I wanna ask you if you can explain that how it works and what doctors see when they're logged in. Well, how about, maybe one of the doctors wants to explain that. Yeah, sure, why don't you explain it, because you're the guys who use it, not me. Sure. My name is Jeff Gooden. I direct Englewood's Pain and Palliative Care Program. Uh, here at Englewood, we were one of the first to sign up for the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program back when it first, uh, uh, first started. And I'll tell you, it really has almost revolutionized the way we screen our patients for behaviors or misuse or abuse with prescription pain medicines. So when we log into the system with a username and password, we basically enter the patient's name, date of birth, and sometimes some other demographic information. And with one click of the mouse, until recently we were given just New Jersey's uh, prescription uh, data. And I believe the pharmacies have a limited amount of time, and, and recently that's changed to, I think within 24 hours of filling a prescription, a pharmacy has to enter the data into the database. So we're only one day behind. Historically it was a few weeks behind, but now within, we'll have data within 24 hours. So when I check a patient's database, we query the database, it comes up the patient's name, and if they use Will, Willie, William, Bill, it has an algorithm built in to, to scan all of the associated names. It tells us where they filled the drug, which pharmacy, name, address, and telephone number, which prescription medication did they get, how many pills, at what dose, who was the prescriber, and anything like refills on, uh, on Schedule three or, or greater medications. So the database returns information within seconds. So it really has been a great addition, giving us all of the information that we need to know about a particular prescription. So if you see a patient has gotten a drug you might prescribe, that tells you how frequently they've done it and when. Of course, and, and as you heard, one of the most important issues about today's announcement is that we're within minutes of the New York State border. So being able to see where patients fill their prescriptions and trying to pick up those doctor shoppers. And it's not just for the misbehaviors. I have to tell you, there are some you know, patients who might get very similar prescriptions from another clinician unknowingly and start to take two medications of the same type. Or you've heard a lot of the press about patients who combine sleeping pills or sedative medicines with opioid pain medications, a very dangerous combination, often unknowingly. So a fair number of the deaths that we've heard about, uh, as a matter of fact, the majority of the deaths that we've heard about are unintentional. Almost 80% of the time, they're unintentional. So having the prescription drug monitoring program not only lets us find the misbehaviors, so to speak, with prescription pain medicines, but it also allows us to uncover some real patients and, and protect them from drug-drug interactions. Thank you. So glad he answered that. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, or are we done? Governor, one more question. Yeah, sure. Haven't I done enough on that? <laughs> they basically just called them both stupid. I mean, what, where, where else do you think I'm going from here? Well, how quickly do you think they'll destroy each other? I don't think it matters. I think they're done already. I, listen, this is like giving a blood transfusion to a corpse. <laughs> I mean, they're done already. It's over. I've told you guys this for a long time. This is over. Donald Trump's going to be the Republican nominee for President of the United States. And, and, and it's over. So all this other stuff, all this brokered convention stuff, and now we're going to have an alliance, and then Kasich says, well, I don't know if I really meant that. I think I, they can still vote for me, but maybe I won't campaign there or I won't pay for ads there. This is, this is like giving a blood transfusion to a corpse. That's exactly what it's like. And, and the fact is that nobody here would do that because dead is dead. So, you know, the fact is that that's where they are politically at the moment. And tonight you know, will once again prove that um, all up and down the East Coast. And so remember something, the South was where Ted Cruz was supposed to win. That was his firewall. He's supposed to win there. Trump won everywhere there. This was over a long time ago. It's just some of the less astute haven't figured it out yet or the desperate. So this is just another desperate maneuver by two candidates who you know, I was one of them. Join the club, guys.
there's, you know, like 13 of us waiting over here for you. <laughs> Don't worry. 13 of us are waiting over here for you. Come on over. We got a couple of chairs for you. The water's warm, you know? Don't worry about it. Oh, everything's fine. I mean, they, they, they just haven't come to grips with that yet. I understand that. It's hard to come to grips with it. You run for president, you want to be president. And, you know, some of us are just more realistic than others. But, you know, how long is this going to take? This has nothing to do with it. This is just kind of the last thrashings before the final last rites are given. That's all. Uh, yeah, one more. Oh, well, Michael, how can I say no to you, Michael? The dean. Uh, yes, dean. Good. Thank you for the appropriate title, Michael. I appreciate that. As did the the deaths of the other people. That they, that contributed to it as well. Let me tell you something. I last year I nominated another Republican to the uh, to the elect. The nominee was never given a hearing, never given a vote on the committee. I nominated Eric Hasso, a former assistant United States attorney. Um, his nomination is still pending, as we speak right now. Want to create a quorum? Create a quorum. Right now, I'm waiting, and I've said this to the Senate President and to others. Uh, you got names for ELEC from the Democratic side? Send them to me. I'll consider them. But, you know, I haven't gotten any. So, you know, the fact is that um, the nominations process in the Senate has been, you know, a bit odd. I've got six, I think, right now, cabinet members who have not been confirmed. Cabinet members. Go back and look at the history of this state. I've had trouble getting cabinet members confirmed throughout this entire administration not for any reason about their qualifications. And then the irony, of course, is that I have Democratic legislators who complain that I have people in an acting position. Well, I nominate them. You don't move on them. What am I supposed to do? Let the department have nobody running it? Then I would be accused of not effectively and efficiently running the government. You know, it's the same games all the time, right? So they want some people on elect. Give me some names. You send me some qualified people, I'll consider nominating them. I nominated a judge from the state Senate yesterday who was swiftly confirmed. You know, S Senator Barnes, like, you know, my idea of what I'd want for a judge, eh, we'll see. But, you know, it was a Democratic seat. Democrats from Middlesex County came and suggested his name. He was vetted by the Bar Association and by our group of, uh, of reviewers inside the governor's office, both counsel's office and the independent ones that we have. He was deemed to be qualified. And I nominated him. Like, I nominate lots of Democrats all the time. But, you know, now all of a sudden, elect, there's some dark conspiracy. You know, like, so... Uh, Listen, there's no protecting Joe DiVincenzo. I've been his friend for lots of years. You know, he's got to take care of himself, and that's not my job to do. Uh, the fact is, ELEC does what ELEC does. And we had some very good people, and for most of the time of my governorship, we had four active members, two former Superior Court judges, one Republican, one Democrat, a longtime uh, person involved in campaign finance on the Republican side, and an outstanding prosecutor is now a justice in the New Jersey Supreme Court on the Democrat side. And they operated for a long time until um, two of the folks, one Republican, one Democrat, both tragically passed away. We had a full complement on the elect most of the time I've been here, including, as I understand it from what I've read in the papers, the beginning of whatever elect was doing in its investigation of, of uh, Joe DiVincenzo. So, you know, everybody wants to see a conspiracy everywhere. Believe me, I've heard in the last two weeks, I've heard some conspiracies from places that would just absolutely make your head spin, Michael, all coming from Democrat, liberal legislators and interest groups who all they want is to see their name in the paper. That's it. It's a good day for them when their name's in the paper. It's a better day when their name's in the paper saying something bad about me. So that's okay. I get it. I've been here for a while. I understand it. There's no basis in fact to any of it, but that's okay. They don't have to be. 
They don't have to be. The same way that they always want documents from us all the time. But I, I love the fact that they want every bit of information from us under a law that doesn't apply to them. Wouldn't I love to Oprah the legislature? Why is Do you think it was an accident? Do you think somehow they forgot? Let's, let's set a broad sweeping law under a Democratic governor with a Democratic legislature, and let's apply it just to the executive branch. But the public has no interest in knowing what the emails, text messages, letters, anything else that, that the 120 people who determine what the budget's going to be in the state are doing. And no one sees the hypocrisy in that. Yet they stand up and yell and scream and send in their Oprah requests every week for every piece of paper they want from us. But we can't ask for one piece of paper from them. Hypocrites. They are hypocrites. Each and every one of them are hypocrites for not allowing the Oprah law to apply to themselves. The same way pay to play doesn't apply to them. You, know, you want campaign finance reform? Let's make sure that anybody who has a contract with the state of New Jersey can't donate to a legislator either. Because the folly that somehow the only people who decide who gets money in this state is the executive branch is laughable. I did a whole bunch of prosecutions on that when I was U.S. attorney. A whole bunch of prosecutions on individual little items that they put in the budget. They put in the budget. Because remember, I recommend they write the budget. <coughs> so pay to play doesn't apply to them, but it's a wonderful law. Really helps to keep the integrity of the system, according to them, but not to them. Just to the governor and the state parties. And Oprah, we should have the light shine on everything that happens in government. I totally agree. Happy to do that. Except it doesn't apply to them. Not to them. So, you know, it makes me laugh. Stuff all makes me laugh. And what it makes the people of New Jersey is sick and dismissive. Dismissive of their pronouncements day after day after day. They don't want acting people in jobs that confirm Gruwal. Clearly qualified. Why isn't he confirmed? Because one of the senators liked the last guy better? So I want to sign senatorial courtesy? And don't even get me started on senatorial courtesy. Right? So, you know, I got a bunch of acting prosecutors around the state, none of whom have been criticized for a moment for their professionalism and the way they conduct their offices. All of whom, the ones I've appointed and picked, have been professional prosecutors. Professional prosecutors. Not hack lawyers who make more as a prosecutor than they made in their private practice. Not those. The ones I've appointed have been people who have dedicated their life to prosecuting crime. And yet, in Monmouth, we still have an acting prosecutor for years. In Union, we still have an acting prosecutor for years. I had to fire the prosecutor in my own county and put the one I wanted in as an acting because the Senate wouldn't move on his nomination. This guy's an acting. It's disgraceful. It's disgraceful. It's all just used, you know, for leverage and showtime. Same thing with judges, Michael. Same thing with judges. I gave a long speech at Seton Hall Law School a couple weeks ago in the Hobbs Lecture Series. They wanted to know about the judicial nominating process in New Jersey. I said, give me a break. The least important person in the judicial nominating process in New Jersey is the governor. The least important person. When I tell you of the judges that I've nominated over six and a half years, how many I picked? I picked? 15, 20% I picked. Somehow, since Governor Kane left office, this has transformed into the Senate picks judges. I've had senators from my own party say to me, these are my seats. Your seats? Where in the Constitution say they're your seats? I got to negotiate if there's five, maybe I get one. So, you know, a lot of this stuff is just folly and ridiculousness including the stuff that you mentioned as well. And so, you know, people should know this. The governor nominates. The governor nominates my eye. The governor begs and cajoles and pleads with petulant state senators who think they get to pick. And you know what? They're right. 
They're right. They get to pick. Because they got senatorial courtesy. They say, you can pick whoever you want, Governor, but I'm not even going to let them have a hearing. You can point whoever you want to your cabinet, but I'm not going to give them a hearing. You can point whoever you want to the prosecutor's job. I'm not going to give them a hearing. And then they complain that you have too many acting people in the jobs. People took a little time to just think about this, and I'm glad they don't, quite frankly, because they got a lot more important things to be concerned about. But if they spent any time thinking about it, there'd be lots of changes. Lots of changes. Yeah, no, I'm done. You can put your hands down. We've had enough. Um, I want to thank the folks at Englewood for hosting us today. I appreciate it very much. Um, I want to thank Amanda again and her mom for being here today. I want to thank the folks from Hackensack who are here as well. Hackensack is playing a big role in this as well, and we appreciate the work that they're doing. Um, I want to thank the prosecutor. Um, for leading his office with uh, honor and integrity and with a sensitivity to the fact that drug addiction is a disease and that he's going to be part of the solution by making sure that law enforcement through drug courts and other things that we can do help to give people the tools they need like Amanda was given nine years ago to deal with their addiction. And when they do, um, we're going to have better families in this state, safer families. And people shouldn't delude themselves into thinking this is just happening, you know, in the state cities. It's not. We have 565 municipalities in this state and thousands of little streets. Go around, as I do often, and drive down those little streets in those small towns and look at those houses with the lights on at night, and they're happening in those houses, too. We just don't talk about it. We need to talk about it. And as long as I'm governor, I'm going to continue to. So thank you all for being here. Appreciate it.